All right. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to uh, tonight's discussion. Uh, well, the topic today is peace and violence in Christianity and Islam. Um, our two speakers today are Mr. David Wood and Brother Shadid Lewis. Uh, Mr. David Wood is a teaching fellow in philosophy. He is a former atheist who converted to Christianity after examining the historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection. And he runs the blog www.answeringmuslims.com and is co-director of Acts 17 Apologetics Ministries. Uh, on my right is Brother Shadid Lewis. He is the president of the Hampton Mosque and Islamic Center. He received a certification in comparative studies from the Islamic Research and Propagation Center. He has studied Islamic family law, Quranic sciences at the Islamic American Open University in Fairfax, Virginia. And he is a, mem a member of the Muslim Darwa Initiative. Uh, it is a grassroots project formed by experienced Muslim apologists, researchers, and speakers from all walks of, these, of the Muslim community. MDI is aimed at articulating the case for Islam as a rational belief, way of life, and international movement for human peace and justice. Uh, the format of tonight's discussion is going to begin with 30-minute opening remarks by each side, followed by a 15-minute response session, and then a 10-minute rebuttal, and closing remarks by each of the, of the speakers for five minutes. And at the end, we will have a question and answer session. Uh, we begin the dialogue with a verse from the Holy Quran, chapter number 16, verse number 125, which says, Invite all to the way of your Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching, and debate with them in ways that are best and most gracious, for your Lord knows best who has strayed from his path and who has received guidance. And with that, we'd like to begin. All right, so alaikum to others. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I bear witness that there is no god but Allah and that Muhammad is his servant and messenger. Peace be upon him. Um, it does me a great pleasure to actually be the one to present the case for uh, peace and violence from the Islamic perspective due to the fact that uh, in today's current events we, we hear a lot of things going on around the world and many of the uh, events are said to be perpetrated by Muslims and uh, unfortunately there are those who would exploit those activities of these few to make it appear that the entire religion of Islam is uh, to blame for such acts and that even all Muslims are to blame for such acts, or all Muslims support such acts because obviously we are Muslim. So it does me a great honor to be able to present the case and show what Islam actually and truly teaches concerning this issue. Now I'm not here to deny that there are people who say there are Muslims who have perpetrated uh, horrendous acts, but what I'm going to show is that their actions are not supported by the teachings of Islam. And as I get into that, let me first say that we, as Muslims, we get our guidelines on how we conduct our daily lives, whether it be as individuals, families, communities, and nations. We get it from our number one source, which is the Quran, which is, to Muslims, believed to be the word of God, Allah. So that supersedes, that, that supersedes anything that anyone says. Next, we take our uh, rulings and lessons from the what is known of the Sunnah, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but of course only the authentic Sunnah, because as soon as Hadith is not like the Quran, there are things that have been made up, fabricated, and there's a science and there are categories of Hadith which are from you know good, reliable, to weak, even totally fabricated. So it doesn't hold the same position as does the Quran, but nonetheless, when it comes to authentic Hadith, we will take that and use that as well. After that, people look to the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, some generations after him, and then we see what some of the scholars have to say. What I'm going to do, though, is base my evidence on the, the, the uppermost, of course, which is the Quran, and we shall take a look at some of the things that the Hadith says. We don't base our Islam on what some leader of some group said, right? We don't base our, what we do based on what some Muslim 
said, whether he was on TV or whatever, that's not what we base our guidance on. We base it on what Islam says. So if some person, some man who claims he's a leader of Muslims, he says, he tells Muslims to do something or he orders some type of activity. If it's not backed up by the Quran, even though he says he's a Muslim, he can say Allahu Akbar before he committed the act or whatever. It does not matter if that action, if these actions are not backed up by the teachings, the authentic teachings of Islam. And so, as I said, there are those who have exploited these activities in an attempt to demonize Islam, the religion, and the Muslim people. You may have know, you may know some of their names, people like uh, Robert Spencer, or Wali Shubat, things of that nature. I don't think David is, as, is like these people, but these, these people who, who I've been listening to and, and studying what they've been saying, this is where they seem to try to go, you know, to try to demonize, and they claim they're using authentic sources, but as we present the case, we'll see otherwise. So let us get into it. So again, starting with the, uh, the, the top source where Muslims get our guidance, which is the Quran, as Allah tells us uh, in the second chapter, that uh, this is the book that, he has, that has been revealed and verily in it is guidance. So when we look at those uh, verses that have to do with uh, the Islamic perspectives on violence and peace, we see that uh, starting in, our, in the second chapter, which is chapter 2, verse 190 of the Quran, we see that a command is given to fight. And what does it say? Here it says, fight in the cause of Allah those who fight you, but do not transgress the limits or do not be the aggressor, for surely Allah loves not the aggressor. And these verses are in context basically from chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 190, going to uh, 193, okay? And you'll see it, it, it's going on about fighting those who have attacked the Muslims and uh, things of that nature. And then we see in verse 92 that Allah says, but if they cease, meaning if they stop from the fighting, if they stop from the persecution of the Muslims, then Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. And, and verse 193, uh, and fight them until there is no more persecution. This is the translation of the Arabic word fitna, which carries a number of meanings as uh, tor turmoil, tribulation, but many of the translation translated as persecution based on the historical fact that the Muslims were actually being persecuted for their beliefs. So this is the same fight until there is no more persecution. Okay? Uh, and I, I'm stressing that point because you see it doesn't say continue fight even if they stop. Just wipe them out regardless, continue to kill, or, no. It says that if the enemy, those who oppose or those who have been attacking you, persecuting you, stop, then cease. There should be no further conflict, okay? We see in uh, chapter, uh, let's, let's go to chapter 5. Verse, or actually, let me, let me try to stay in order. Let's go to chapter 4, verse 75 of the Quran. And here we have, here, here Allah says, here again, giving the context in which whenever Muslims do engage in any type of conflict, here's, these are the purposes. It is not to uh, propagate the faith through violence. We are not commanded to have an ongoing battle with, uh, you know, fit or physical battle with non-Muslims as people have asserted that Muslims are ordered to kill infidels and, no, this is not correct, here's what Allah says. It says, and why should you not fight in the cause of Allah on behalf of those who being weak and are ill-treated ill and oppressed, men, women, and children whose cry is, our Lord, rescue us from this town whose people are oppressors and raise for us from you one who will protect, and raise for us from you one who will help. You see? So this, these are the context. This is the context in which you will find the verses of the Quran that do speak of any type of conflict. These, this is the context. Because remember, the Quran is all one book revealed by Allah. It is not a book of different chapters or different uh, sections written by different people. For the Muslim is believed that the entire book is all from Allah, so we take it as a whole. So if I see a verse in, in, in several chapters later that speak of fighting, it, it's, it, it has to be in the context of these verses, okay? And that is the case. 
All right. So uh, let us continue. We see in uh, chapter eight again, continuing on, that Allah speaks again. I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 38 through 40. Yes, chapter 8, verse 38 through 40. And again, these are all in the context of battles that have been going on. All right? And Allah says, And say to the unbelievers, If now they desist from the fighting and the attacking, their past would be forgiven them. But if they persist, the punishment of those before them is already a matter. And again, verse 39, and fight them on until there is no more persecution. And religion becomes the laws in its entirety. But if they cease, if they stop, very little law does see all that they do. You see? So again, it, it, that, that message keeps coming up about fighting against persecution, fighting against oppression, fighting injustice. These are the context of these verses. All right? Um, one verse to drive the point home clearer that Muslims are not to have this continued hostility is a verse that I love and it's a verse that's a, a, a Medina verse and I'll, I'll explain why I'm, I'm mentioning that it's a Medina verse. It's in chapter 60 verse 8 and 9 of the Quran. And here Allah speaks again this chapter 60 verse 8 and 9 okay it says Allah does not forbid you with regard to those who fight you not for your faith, nor drive you out of your homes. Allah does not stop you from dealing kindly and justly with those people. For Allah loveth those who does who are just. Allah only forbids you with regard to those who fight you for your faith and drive you out of your homes and supporting others in driving you out for turning to them in friendship or protection. It is such as turn to them that do wrong. So this verse is clear that the Muslims are not commanded to have this ongoing hostility or conflict. As the verses, I mean, it really needs no explanation, right? It needs no explanation. As long as those people are not trying to fight you for your faith, drive you from your homes, take your land. Then Allah says, deal with these people kindly and justly. And, I, and this verse is, is a Medina verse. The reason why I say that is because a lot of times the argument that is presented is that the verses that I gave earlier were verses revealed in Mecca. And so supposedly the Muslims were weak and so they couldn't do anything so that's why those verses are revealed like that. But later when the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the companions moved to Medina, now they have power so now the verses change into violent verses. But that verse that I just read was a verse revealed in Medina after they had already went, after they had the community, the power, and that's the clear injunction that you, you know, if the people are not fighting you for those reasons, then be kind and just to those people. It's only against those who oppress or drive you out of your homes or trying to fight you for your belief. These are the people that, you know, we, we draw the line with. But if those people are not those type of persons, then deal kindly and just, okay? And I know nowhere, it could, because the other argument is that about abrogation, that the, uh, the earlier verses were abrogated and things of that nature. But we'll get into that uh, in the later part, you know, uh, we need to okay so it, it's clear that this is the overall command of the Muslims this is why the majority of the Muslims in the world today you don't you see are not involved in such conflict the people who are perpetrating the acts that we hear about they are in the far minority the majority of the world's Muslims they just want to live in peace with their neighbors and as you can see that is the case of what's going on so now from here we gave some verses there are other verses there are other verses. Matter of fact, let me deal with a verse very quickly uh, that many like, people like to use to say that Islam is violent. One of the most favorite verses quoted by those who are anti-Islam or perhaps maybe don't understand Islam is Surah 9, verse 5. Right? Most people know the verse, fight them and besiege them, etc. Right? But this verse has a context to it. This verse, that verse, Surah 9, 5, is actually in context with the other verses that I read to you earlier about fighting against persecution, oppression, fight those who fight you first. The proof is right there. When you read the first verses of the chapter, this, those verses are talking about people, the, the pagan Quraysh, who had attacked the Muslims and 
broke the treaty with the Muslims. And so then this verse was revealed about that. And if you keep reading past verse 5 to verse, uh, verse 13, chapter 9, verse 13, it, Allah says it right there in the verse itself. Let's read it. It says it right in the verse itself. So it puts chapter five, uh, excuse me, verse 5 right in context. But unfortunately, those who have an agenda, they don't look because they only read the one verse by itself. And they don't look any further to see. And I, I'm surprised that they don't see the verses that come before verse 5 either. That it clearly says that these, that it was speaking about the pagan Quraysh who broke the treaty. They made an agreement with the Muslims and the treaty had been broken on their part. You see? But let's go. You see in chapter uh, 9, verse 13, look what it says. Right? If you keep reading from verse 5 all the way to 13, or rather start from verse 1, so everything is in context. Verse 13 says, will you not fight people who violated their oaths? and plotted to expel the messenger, and they attack you first. It's right there. Right there, right in the verse, very clearly. So chapter 9, verse 5 is in context there, but still with Muslims being attacked first. It is not an order for Muslims to just go out. Now, now you have the permission to go out and fight and start slaughtering infidels. That's not what the verse is saying. But this is how those who are anti-Islamic, or like I said, maybe they misunderstand, you know, this is the verse that they used to say, yes, this verse, this, this is, verse is, is a command for Muslims with an open, indiscriminate command to go forward and start slaughtering infidels. That's the verse. But as we see, the context is clear. They tried, these people tried, they violated the oath. Number one, Allah says they violated their oaths. They tried to expel the messenger and they attacked you first. They attacked the Muslims first. And if you know the history or the Sirah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, we know that they did. They did these things. They expelled the Muslims. The Muslims, some Muslims had to run to Ethiopia. We know they tried to assassinate the Prophet a number of times. So all the, the Quran was revealed in that climate, in a climate of the Muslims being the underdog, in the climate of the Muslims being the one persecuted and attacked. They were not the ones going forward being the aggressors. They were the ones who were under the persecution and being attacked. Okay? So now let's jump to the Hadith, the second source, and see what it has to say. Okay, uh, we have here in the book by uh, Hajjal, Ibn Hajjal al Asqalani, the, I'll read the English title, it's Attainment of the Objective According to the Evidences of the Ordinances. And what this is, is a collection of, of hadith um, from the different hadith collections. Okay, and uh, there's a hadith narrated by Anas that said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, use your property yourselves and your tongues in striving against the polytheists or unbelievers, okay? And the scholars say the interpretation, which I think is clear already, but just in case you, know, you don't understand it, in saying that this is speaking about the struggle, which is the jihad, which means the struggle. It doesn't mean holy war. But it said it is applicable at all times. Sometimes it may be a physical confrontation. There's no denying that. Sometimes it may be a physical confrontation. Sometimes it is by spending your money, which is your property. And sometimes it is merely by one's verbal endeavor, your tongue, as the prophet said, using your tongue. Like now, you see, we're dealing with the situation verbally. There's no need for, you know, for, to get physical. So we, we can speak on the issue and deal with the Robert Spencers and the Wally Shubas, etc. We can deal with them verbally. They want to attack verbally, we, we respond verbally. There's no need for any type of violence, okay? So this is here, this is what the prophet, peace be upon him, said about such matters. All right, um, let's see. There's another hadith from Bukhari, volume 4, book 52, hadith number 266, in which it was narrated by Abu Huraira, which said, The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Do not wish to meet the enemy, but if you do happen to meet the enemy, be patient. I want to stress the first part of the hadith, which is don't wish to meet the enemy. Don't wish for battle. Don't wish for conflict. But if it should happen, then the prophet said to be patient and bear such conflicts with patience. But he said, don't wish for it. Now this is clearly contrary to what we've been hearing, that Muslims are commanded to look for the conflict, to desire, to want, to go out and fight and kill the so-called, you know, the infidel, etc. Here the prophet saying, don't, don't wish for such things. And again, that's from Bukhari, which is said to be one of the most reliable collections of hadith. All right, so there's no denying that. There's no denying that. So, this is the Islamic, and there's a, there's a number of other hadiths out there. There's a number, and again, any, any hadiths 
that do mention the battles that the Prophet had, those are all in context of what I read from the Quran. The whole climate of that time period was the Muslims were the ones who were being persecuted and attacked. Whether it was by the pagan Quraysh, whether it was by Bani Quraysh, some of the, 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 the Jewish tribes that were, had aligned themselves with the Quraysh, all of these were in context of the Muslims fighting back in self-defense, okay? Or sometimes making preemptive strikes, but still preemptive in the, in the sense that they, there, was, there was an awareness or knowledge that an attack was imminent, and so they acted preemptively, but it was preemptive in self-defense. Which brings me now to the next uh, um, position. Let's take a look and see what the scholars have to say. Again, we rely mostly or highly first on the Quran, and then we look at Hadith. But let's take a look and see what the people of knowledge have to say about this issue. All right, I look, I take from uh, the book, The Rights of Non-Muslims in the Islamic World, by Dr. Sully Hussein Al-Ayyad. And on page 42 and 43 of his book, he mentions here, he says that even in war, he, he said even in war, which is talking about the struggle of jihad, can only occur for valid reasons and moral goods. It can only take place for the following reasons. He says, one, as a response to an act of aggression, as stated in the Quran, he mentions the verses that I gave earlier, chapter two, verse uh, 190, and some of the other verses. He says, the second reason, as a penalty for those who break a treaty or violate a truth, a truce, as Allah stated, um, we, we mentioned chapter nine, verse 12 and verse 13, mentioning that they broke the oath the and they attacked the Muslims first. Chapter, uh, the next reason, number three, is as a deterrent to those who have been persecuting or preventing missionaries, Muslim missionaries, or those who do da'wah, uh, of the faith from traveling to the people as it is stated by Allah and fight them on until there is no more persecution all right and religion becomes the laws but if they stop let there be no hostility except against those who practice oppression and you see that, that I want to stress that again you see the command is clear right that again what does Allah say in Surah chapter 2 verse 1 and 3 that but if they cease let there be no hostility except those who practice oppression these are the reasons that, you know, Muslims, if, if it's a physical confrontation, that it may, it's for those reasons. And again, even the persecution or oppression, it can still take the means that the Prophet spoke about. If it, if you can handle, if it can be dealt with by verbally speaking out against the injustice, so be it. If you have to spend money to help get people in, in leadership or whatever to, who can change the situation, so be it. The, the a physical confrontation is the last resort. If that can be avoided, then that is the best course of action, okay? So there, and let me quote another uh, shaykh or scholar just to drive the point home. We have uh, Dr. or Sheikh uh, Ati, Atiya Sakr. He was the head of the of Al-Azhar Fatwa Committee, and this is what he states, all right? He says, the jihad is one of the most misunderstood and abused aspects of Islam. He mentions very honestly that some Muslims there are some Muslims who exploit and misuse the concept to their own political objectives, and I agree with him, that's very true. And then he says there are also many non-Muslims who misunderstand it as well. And they use it, as I mentioned, Robert Spencer, etc., to misinterpret it to discredit Islam and Muslims. So here's what he says about the reason, he gives three reasons, okay? He gives three reasons that the, you know, if it has to be a physical confrontation or whatever, that here the reasons are as such. He says, having said this, I would like to classify war in Islam into three main categories. Number one is defensive, which is resorted to when the enemies of Muslims attack the religion, honor, property, territories, etc. Number two is the liberating war, which is done to liberate all those who are oppressed, not just Muslims. It can be anybody, like, you know, like our country, the United States. Sometimes we say we send troops to other countries to liberate people in different countries. Well, that's an Islamic principle, to send troops, if it need be, to help people who are oppressed. Even if, they're, even if they're not Muslims, the Muslims can do so. And third is preemptive, which is launched only when Muslims know for sure that there is reason against uh, their peaceful treaties with the enemy when the enemy has a serious plan to attack them. And this is, again, he was the head of the Fatwa Committee of Al-Azhar University, very one among many prominent uh, Muslim places of knowledge and learning. So this is the position of Islam concerning peace and violence. 
yes, Islam is a peaceful religion. And I think many times people, they, they, they use, they're not using it right. Or maybe they don't understand. When we say peaceful, we don't mean passive. Peaceful doesn't mean that we are passive, that we sit by and allow injustices to go forward. You know, like a police officer. A police officer is known as a peacekeeper. But he has a gun, he has the building club, right? If he has to use, he may have to use certain extreme measures to bring back the peace. But does that not mean he's still the peacekeeper? If he can stop you by verbally stopping you or handcuffing you without violence, so be it. As we know many stories, sometimes he may have to. He may have to pull out the gun. He may have to use the billy club in order to restore the peace or stop the one who is violating the peace. But yet it's still, he's known as the one who keeps the peace. He's known he's supposed to be the good guy. You see? So in Islam, we say Islam is peaceful. We don't mean that it's passive. Because many times people mis misunderstand it. They say, well, you say it's peaceful, but look at these verses here. But they don't see those contexts. And the contexts, as I mentioned again, are good, moral, and justified reasons. All right? So uh, with that, we will stop there. And uh, I will pass on to David Wood. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to thank uh, Hampton Moss for hosting this debate. I'm glad I wore uh, clean socks. I forgot about taking the shoes <laughs> off, but uh, uh, I'm all right. And uh, uh, I'd like to begin with. Um, yeah, what's up? How's that work? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to begin by pointing out a few points of agreement between uh, Shadid and myself. One. I agree completely that not everyone who acts in the name of Islam or not everyone who acts in the name of Christianity is following Islam or Christianity. Um, Muslims um, claiming to follow Muhammad have killed people. Christians claiming to follow Jesus have killed people. Uh, but it's clear that not everyone who uh, acts in the name of their religion is following their religion. There's no dispute between us on that point. Uh, I also agree with Shadid that most Muslims do not want to hurt anyone. Uh, most Muslims I've met don't want to uh, kill or slaughter anyone, uh, so there's no disagreement with us on that point as well. Uh, but the topic of our debate isn't what most Muslims believe, it's what Islam teaches and what Christianity teaches about peace and violence. And I remember several years ago I wrote my first, one of my first articles on Islam was on uh, the issue of peace and violence, and I said that if someone were to ask me, is Islam a religion of peace, I would say, what do you mean? First explain what you mean. If you mean that the religion that many Muslims believe in, uh, I would say yes, for many Muslims it is a religion of peace because they believe, uh, they believe that its uh, teachings are peaceful and they go to those Quran verses that promote peace and so for them it is a religion of peace. Uh, but if we're talking about what Muhammad taught, I think the answer is no. If we ask what did Muhammad teach about peace and violence, uh, I think I would give a different answer. Uh, in this debate, we're going to see two things. First, we're going to see that Christian, uh, the Christians are commanded to live in peace with everyone, to love everyone, to harm no one. Violence plays absolutely no role in spreading or propagating Christianity. We're also going to see that according to Muhammad, and according to the Quran, and according to the Hadith, Muslims are, at the end of the day, called to fight people in the name of Islam, not simply in a defensive war, but in an offensive manner as well. Um, but let's begin with Christianity. Uh, Shadi didn't bring this up, but we, we, we do need to address this in the debate, so um, I'll move into Christianity. In Mark 12, one of the scribes asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus answers, uh, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So we have, uh, according to Jesus, uh, the core of Christian morality, and according to Jesus, the core of Christian morality is love, love for God and love for others. We obey God because we love him. We care for others because we love them. 
Now, in the Gospels, Jesus tells us that our lives are to be characterized by gentleness, mercy, and peace. In Matthew 5, 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. In 5, 7, he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And in 5, 9, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Later in the same chapter, Jesus tells his followers uh, not to retaliate against those who uh, persecute us, not to return violence for violence. The Lord says this, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. The Lord continues in verses 43 through 45, he says to the crowd, You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he uh, causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. This is very different from what we're going to see in some of the later teachings of Islam. In Matthew 26, some soldiers come to capture Jesus, and the Apostle Peter pulls out a sword and strikes the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Jesus says to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who uh, take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Then Jesus heals the injured man, a man who uh, was part of the group that was conspiring to have him crucified. In John 18, 36, Jesus is being questioned by Pontius Pilate, who wants to know what Jesus did to upset people so much that they want him crucified. Jesus says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So according to Jesus himself, Christians don't fight. Why? Because the kingdom of God is not an earthly kingdom. So are Jesus' teachings peaceful? Jesus tells us that the greatest commandments are to love God and to love our neighbors. He tells us that we're to be gentle and merciful. He tells us to be peacemakers. He tells us not to return violence for violence, not to retaliate against evil people. He tells us to love everyone, even our enemies, even those who persecute us. He tells us to put down our weapons. He tells, uh, he tells, he tells us that his followers do not fight. Religions just don't get any more peaceful than this. So it's clear that the Gospels promote peace. What about the rest of the New Testament? In Romans 12, the Apostle Paul gives Christians some guidelines about how we're supposed to live. In verse 17, he says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Verse 19, never take your own revenge but leave room for the wrath of God. Don't retaliate. Let God repay evildoers. Verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. Paul tells us to care for our enemies. Jesus said the same thing. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, Paul says, let all that you do be done in love. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4, he says, though we walk according to the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We do not war according to the flesh. Why? Because as Jesus said, his kingdom is not of this world. In Ephesians 5, 2, Christians are commanded to walk in love. In 1 Thessalonians 3.12, uh, Paul says, May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. We are to abound in love for all people. In 1 Thessalonians 5.15, Paul commands us to see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. In 1 Timothy, Timothy 2.1, Paul says to Timothy, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. In Titus 3.2, Paul says that Christians are to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. 
Over and over and over again, Paul tells us to love everyone, to live in peace with everyone, to be gentle towards everyone. We see the emphasis on peace, uh, gentleness, and love in other New Testament passages <coughs> as well. Uh, the author of Hebrews in 12.14 says that Christians are to pursue peace with all men. In James 3.17-18, Jesus' half-brother tells us to seek wisdom from God. And he describes the wisdom that comes from God. He says that the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In 1 Peter 2.17, the Apostle Peter tells us to honor all people. In 3.8-9, Peter says that Christians are to be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. He adds in verse 11 that Christians are to turn away from evil and do good, that we are to seek peace and pursue it. To sum up the position of the New Testament in 1 John 4, 8, the Apostle John says, the one who does not love does not, love, does not know God, because God is love. Now, if Christians are commanded again and again to live in peace with all men, to love everyone, to pray for everyone, to do good to everyone, to be gentle, merciful, and compassionate, to put down our weapons, not to retaliate, not to return evil for evil, not to fight, why would anyone even raise it as an issue whether Christianity is a religion of peace? Well, I find that people tend to misrepresent Christianity in three ways on this issue. Um, first, some people misrepresent the Christian message by distorting certain passages of the New Testament. Um, we've seen that the New Testament clearly calls for Christians to live in peace with everyone. So, uh, if anyone wants to say that the teachings of the New Testament are violent, they have to do so by misrepresentation. Um, I'm not sure whether Shadid is going to do this or not, so uh, we'll wait and see. Uh, second, some people misrepresent uh, the Christian message by pointing to various groups and individuals who have committed violence in the name of Jesus, as if these people are following Jesus' commands. And here, Shadid and I are in agreement that if someone is acting and claims to be acting in the name of Jesus, or claims to be acting in the name of Muhammad, uh, what matters is whether the religion calls for that sort of action, and that's how you determine whether the action is supported by the religion or if it's just a person who's uh, not living up to the standards of the religion. Uh, third, some people misrepresent uh, Christianity by ignoring the fact that uh, Christians are under the New Covenant, not the Old Covenant. The, we have a distinction, Old Testament, New Testament. Testament just means covenant, agreement between God and men. There's a covenant with Adam in the Bible. I'm not under that covenant. There's a covenant with Noah. It's in the Bible. Uh, I'm not under that covenant. There's a covenant with uh, Moses. It's in the Bible. You can read it. Uh, but I am not under that covenant. And finally, there is a covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the covenant that I'm under. That's the covenant that I'm a part of. And nowhere uh, under the covenant uh, of Jesus Christ are, uh, are anyone uh, commanded to commit violence towards anyone. Uh, as part of the New Covenant, I have to follow certain rules. I have to love my enemies. I'm not allowed to shed blood for my religion, ever. Um, now, usually when people uh, criticize Christianity for being too violent, it's common to point out passages from uh, Exodus or Deuteronomy. I'll clarify, Christians do believe that the Old Testament was revealed by God. We believe that there was a purpose uh, for the Old Testament. Uh, but as far as the teachings that we're called to live by right now, these are the teachings uh, commanded in the New Testament. Uh, so, Christianity is a specific covenant between God and men, and again, nowhere are Christians ever commanded to commit violence. So, if we don't misrepresent Christianity in any one of these three ways, uh, what do we have? We have a religion that promotes love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And as Christians in the room know, I'm quoting this list of Christian values, uh, the fruit of the Spirit from the New Testament, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. So Christianity promotes love and peace towards everyone. But what about Islam? There are plenty of teachings in the Quran that Christians would say amen to. 
plenty of teachings that we would agree with. Um, but there are other passages that certainly raise some concerns, and I understand there are passages in the Bible that would raise concerns. Maybe we can talk about some of those. Uh, but we turn to Islam, and for instance, we see in Surah 8, 55, uh, surely the vilest of animals in Allah's sight are those who disbelieve. I disbelieve. If you mean disbelieving in Islam, I'm not. So I am among the vilest of animals. Uh, Surah 332, Allah does not love the unbelievers. That's referring to all non-Muslims, all unbelievers in Islam. Uh, that would mean that Allah has no love for any of us. Now, Muslims are quick to point to passages such as Surah 109, Surah 2, 256, uh, Surah 68, as evidence that Islam is a religion of peace. Uh, what Muslims fail to address is that these, many of these verses were abrogated or canceled by verses that came uh, later. Shadid says that the Quran is just one book. Uh, but the Quran says that some verses which come later abrogate or cancel verses which uh, come before. For instance, um, what's the penalty for sexual indecency according to the Quran? Well, uh, Surah 4.15 says, And as for those who are guilty of an indecency from among your women, call to witnesses against them, four witnesses from among you. Then if they bear witness, that, uh, then confine them to their houses until death takes them away or Allah opens some way for them. So the penalty, according to 415, is house arrest. That's the penalty for sexual sin. Uh, we turn to Surah 24.2. Uh, as for the fornicatress or the fornicator, flog each of them, giving a hundred stripes, and let no pity for them detain you in the matter of obedience to Allah. So which penalty is the one that Muslims are supposed to follow? Well, it's the one that came later. And actually, uh, in the Hadith, we find another, uh, stoning, that's for uh, adultery. So we find different rulings. Now either these are just totally con total contradictions or some have been abrogated and that's the Muslim pattern. That's what we find in Surah 16, 101 for instance, uh, that verses which come later abrogate or cancel verses that come earlier. Now Shadid says that uh, non-Muslims uh, draw a distinction between the Meccan period and the Medinan period and that we say that Muhammad in Mecca uh, was peaceful, but then as soon as he got power, he became more violent. Uh, things aren't that simple. Uh, the, the, the reality is more complicated, um, but we'll go through it. Until he died a few years ago, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Humayd was the chief justice of Saudi Arabia and the imam of the Grand Mosque in Mecca. Uh, scholars don't get much higher than that. Uh, according to Ibn Humayy, there were four stages in the development of the Islamic call to jihad. So it's not simply a matter of there's the Meccan period and then there's the Medinan period where Muslims could be violent. Uh, as Muslims know, the early Muslim community wasn't allowed to fight in Mecca. Even when they were persecuted, uh, they weren't allowed to retaliate. This, according to Ibn Humayy, is stage one. When Muslims were completely outnumbered and couldn't hope to win a physical confrontation, they had to endure persecution without returning violence for violence. And the, and the revelations of Muhammad received during this time were peaceful and tolerant revelations. And by the way, if you, if you describe Muhammad's life during this period to a Christian, uh, we love his life during this period. If you talk about Muhammad in Mecca, uh, that is, he's, living, he's living as we would, as we would expect someone uh, to live under those circumstances. Um, but eventually, when the Muslim community had become large enough to fight a defensive war, uh, Muhammad receives Surah 22, 39 through 40, which says, Permission to fight is given to those upon whom war is made, because they have been oppressed, and most surely Allah is well able to assist them. Those who have been expelled from their homes without a just cause, except that they say, Our Lord is Allah. So now, Muslims could defend themselves against people who were uh, trying to hurt them, casting them out, and so on. But they didn't have to. They didn't, they didn't have to uh, go and fight people who were uh, pressing them. This is stage two, according to Ibn Humayd. When Muslims uh, were strong enough to defend themselves, they were given permission to fight the oppressors, uh, but there was no obligation to fight. Later on, when the Muslims were even stronger, the command changed again. Muhammad received Surah 2, 190 through 191, uh, which says, And fight in the way of Allah with those who fight with you, and do not exceed the limits. Surely Allah does not love those who exceed the limits and kill them wherever you find them, and drive them out from whence they drove you out. At this point, according to Ibn Humayy, uh, Muslims were commanded to fight 
Anyone who attacks the Muslim community, this is stage three. Fighting people oppress you or attack the Muslim community is an obligation, it's now required. Now, Muslim apologists in the West, and my friend Shadid, uh, seem to think that this is the last stage of Islam, and that Muslims are simply called to fight in self-defense. But Muhammad's final marching orders were quite different. If we want to know what Muhammad's final commands were about fighting, we have to go to Surah 9, which is one of the last two surahs uh, that were revealed to Muhammad. In Surah 929, we read, Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day. Notice, what, what does that say? Fight the, the oppressors? No. Fight those who are attacking you? No. Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that which, uh, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth, Islam, from among the people of the book, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Here Muslims are commanded not simply to fight oppressors, but to fight those who do not believe in Islam, uh, including Christians and Jews. Muslims were told to fight people because they had different religious beliefs. Now, if you don't believe that this is the correct interpretation, uh, consider some things that we read in the Hadith. Notice uh, Shadid says, and I agree with the methodology, Quran first, Hadith, commentators and scholars. In Sahih al-Bukhari number 6924, Muhammad says this, I have been ordered to fight people till they say, La Allah illa Allah, and whoever says this, Allah will save his property and his life from me. Here Muhammad says that he has been ordered to fight people until they recite the creed, until they become Muslims. In Sahih Muslim number 30, Muhammad says something similar. I have been commanded to fight against people so long as they do not declare that there is no God but Allah. What's the reason for fighting here? People aren't reciting the creed. This command had nothing to do with fighting oppressors or fighting people who were attacking you. The sole criterion here for fighting people is that they were not Muslims. And we find the same thing when we turn to Islam's commentators and scholars. Ibn Kathir, Islam's greatest commentator on the Quran, sums up stage four, uh, once Surah 9 has been revealed. Uh, he, say, he sums this up as follows. Therefore, all people of the world should be called to Islam. If any one of them refuses to do so, or refuses to pay the jizya, they should be fought till they are killed. This doesn't come from the Al-Qaeda handbook. This comes from Ibn Kathir. This teaching is at the very core of Islam, and we find similar teachings from many other Muslim scholars. Ibn Taymiyyah says that whoever has heard the summons of the Messenger of God and has not responded to it must be fought. Uh, the Hanafi jurist Shaybani says that Muslims are to combat those who do not believe in Allah. Uh, Sheikh Burhanuddin Ali says that the destruction of the sword is incurred by infidels although they be not the first aggressors. So even if they're not the ones attacking, they have incurred the sword simply because they're infidels. According to Verowiz, uh, the medieval master of Islamic law, scholars agree that all polytheists should be fought. The Maliki jurist uh, Ibn Khaldun says that in the Muslim community, the holy war is a religious duty because of the universalism of the Muslim mission and the obligation to convert everybody to Islam, either by persuasion or by force. Maliki jurist uh, Ibn Abi Zayd says this, Jihad is a precept of divine institution. It is preferable not to begin hostilities with the enemy before having invited the latter to embrace the religion of Allah, except where the enemy attacks first. They have the alternative of converting to Islam or paying the poll tax, short of which war will be declared against them. And if you'd like a modern Muslim authority, Ibn Humayd, again, uh, Chief Justice of Saudi Arabia until he died, says this, Allah revealed in Surat At-Tawbah the order to discard all the obligations, covenants, etc., and commanded the Muslims to fight against all the mushrikun, as well as against the people of the scriptures, Jews and Christians, if they do not embrace Islam, till they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So Muslims were not permitted to abandon the fighting against them, pagans, Jews, and Christians, and to reconcile with them and to suspend hostilities for an unlimited period while they are strong and able to fight against them. 
So as long as Muslims are strong enough to fight, stage four is always in effect. <coughs> so Muslims are commanded to fight people because of their religious beliefs. This is what the Quran says, it's what we find in Abu Qari and on Muslim, and it's the position of some of Islam's greatest commentators and scholars. Now, if it's obvious that Muslims are commanded to fight non-Muslims, why do Muslims claim that Islam only tells Muslims to fight those who are oppressing Islam? Uh, here I have to say many Muslims really do believe this, but at the same time those who uh, do understand this four-stage pattern, uh, those Muslims, if they're in the West, are commanded are commanded uh, to keep people in the dark about this. Uh, here we can turn to Surah 328, which when it's translated property, properly, uh, says that if Muslims feel threatened by a stronger adversary, they're allowed to pretend to be friendly. Ibn Kathir comments on this verse. In this case, such believers are allowed to show friendship outwardly, but never inwardly. Abu Darda, one of Muhammad's companions, put it this way. We smile in the face of some people, though our hearts curse them. Ibn Kathir goes on to say that uh, taqiyya is permitted until the day of resurrection. So Muslims are permitted uh, to seek peace temporarily if the Muslim community is not strong enough to fight. Uh, apart from that, Muslims are told not to be peaceful. Uh, Surah 4735 says, Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace when you should be uppermost. According to Ibn Kathir, this verse means that Muslims shouldn't compromise, seek peace, or end the fighting with non-Muslims when Muslims are in a position of power. Well, when are Muslims allowed to seek peace? Ibn Kathir tells us. He says, if the disbelievers are considered more powerful and numerous than the Muslims, then the Imam may decide to hold a treaty if he judges that it entails a benefit for the Muslims. I'm seeing a pattern here. If Muslims are strong, they're told to fight everyone. If they're weak, they're told to pretend to be friendly and to seek a temporary peace while they build enough strength to fight. Uh, is this a religion of peace? Again, I, I know that many people don't agree with, with uh, the uh, version of Islam I'm presenting here, but as it seems in the Muslim sources, uh, there seems to be a religion that only calls for peace when Muslims are too weak to win a war. Um, now, so why do many Muslims uh, reject this? Well, some people are just naturally more peaceful. Some people uh, who have grown up in the West um, do have uh, values. Uh, the United States is a massive melting pot, and we have a mis mixture of uh, all kinds of teaching from various uh, cultures. And I'm certainly glad, certainly glad that uh, many Muslims do not want to hurt anyone. Um, but I think it's clear that, uh, according to the Muslim sources and your greatest scholars, Muslims are called to fight those who do not accept Islam and refuse to pay the jizya. Uh, now, I, I think this is as violent as a religion can be without instantly destroying itself. So, what's the peace, what's the role of peace in Islam? As we've seen, Muslims are called to seek peace when they're too weak to fight. If they're strong, they're specifically told in the Quran that they must not seek peace. That's the position of Islam. And how do Muslims respond? Well, uh, Shadid has presented us with uh, some verses, and these verses, of course, are uh, abrogated. Let's look at a couple of them. He quoted Surah 2, 190, Fight in the cause of God, those who do not fight you, but do not transgress limits, for God loveth not the transgressors. I would refer you to uh, Chasir uh, Jalalain on 2, 190. He says that this stipulation was abrogated by Surah 9. Uh, Shadid also quoted uh, the Quran, Surah 68, uh, quoting also to the Tafsir Jalalain, God does not forbid you in regard to those who do not wage war against you from among the disbelievers on account of religion and do not expel you from your homes, that you should treat them kindly. This was revealed before the command to struggle against them, to struggle against who? To struggle against all the unbelievers. Uh, so, uh, Shadid says that these verses haven't been canceled. Some of his greatest commentators say otherwise. Uh, Shadid says that uh, verse 9, 13 shows that, um, oh, interesting. He says that verse 9, 13 in the Quran shows that uh, the call to fight, the, to slay the infidel in 9, 5 is referring to those who uh, cast out the Muslims. And he reads verse 13. Well, if you want to see what this verse is really about, you have to go to the verse immediately before it. And if they break, this is talking about something that happens afterwards. This is after Muslims are in a dominant position, they've already conquered Mecca. If the unbelievers break 
any sort of agreement, then you fight them. Uh, verse 12, and if they break their oaths after their agreement and openly revile your religion, referring to speaking against Islam, if they openly revile your religion, then fight the leaders of unbelief. Surely their oaths are nothing so that they may desist. Then you have verse 13, what are you not uh, will you not fight a people who broke their oaths and aimed at the expulsion of the apostle? So this verse isn't saying, hey, you're fighting people who broke an oath. It's saying, if these people break their oaths, you have to fight them. What? Are you not willing to fight people who break an oath uh, with Muhammad? So what do we have? Hmm? Okay. So we have abrogated verses. And then we have the clear pattern that is established in the Quran. Um, again, if you don't believe in abrogation, what do you do when the passages contradict one another? When we go, when we follow the Muslim method of interpreting these passages, the earlier verses are abrogated by passages that come later, and the passages uh, that come at the end of Muhammad's life, the passages that came down as Muhammad's final marching order say, not fight the oppressors, it says fight those who do not believe in Allah. Uh, to sum up, we've seen that Christians are commanded to live in peace, to love everyone, even our enemies. We're called to do good to everyone, to honor everyone, to pray for everyone, to be merciful, to be gentle, to be compassionate. We're told not to retaliate, not to take revenge, not to hate, uh, not to war according to the flesh, not to fight. We've seen that according to Christianity, the greatest thing in the world is love. And we've seen that the only way to make Christianity sound violence is misrepresenting it by either uh, distorting the teachings of the New Testament, by pointing to people who claim to be following the commands of Jesus and aren't really following the commands of Jesus, and by confusing the New, the new Covenant with the Old Covenant. There are, again, plenty of passages in the Quran that Christians would agree with, but as far as uh, Muhammad's final marching orders are concerned, uh, Muslims are told that uh, as long as they're strong enough to fight, they must fight Everyone, there's very different teachings. Uh, Christians are told that God loves everyone, even those who persecute and kill us. And so we have to love everyone, and we have to, leave, uh, we have to love uh, and live in peace with everyone.